This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Hello, you're listening to Animal Party on Pet Life Radio. And today we have Dr. Jory. Welcome to the show, Dr. Jory Bachnitz. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, we were just talking about how winter came late for you and people in the east of North America, or the center, I should say, because I'm way in the west. But yep. what does that mean for pets? Do they not have their coats? or Do they need more help? It's been really weird. All the Arctic breeds, their coats don't know what to do. So some okay? of them are looking really moth-eaten because they're shedding again. Others haven't started to grow their coat. Everyone's dropping massive tons of fur. Ugh. We're also seeing substantially larger numbers of tick infections and an increase in Lyme disease in our area because every week it goes over four degrees and people are out and about doing their thing. And during the time of year, you wouldn't suspect you'd have to treat for parasites. We're having to do it. I just re- I, As early as three days ago, I had their Lyme positive case. Oh, no. What does that mean for the people? Like if your dog tests positive for Lyme, do you have to worry that your kids will too? I think it's important that you know that it's there. I mean, I, I wouldn't be rushing to get everybody tested, especially if nobody's unwell, nobody has any clinical signs or marks or anything. But what we really are seeing is just a dramatic shift in parasite carry diseases simply because of the climate change that we are absolutely seeing. And it's been steadily growing and the season is slowly getting broader. The heartworm season used to be five to six months because you needed a, a warmer, like over 12 or 15 degrees for a couple of weeks. But that is also stretching. So the shoulders of the seasons kind of are getting broader. And basically what I'm saying to people now, when you look at the last few winters, every month has several days minimum where it goes above four degrees. And so if you are like us, where you're taking your dogs into the woods on a regular basis, I keep my guys on tick prevention all year long. If you're your sidewalk, backyard, still snow, then your exposure is less. And I think it's then really just about what your, what your comfort zone is. I think it's less important. But for people who are going to areas where we know the ticks reside and we have the wildlife that carry them, then I'm really recommending longer periods of prevention. Okay. So you keep saying four degrees, but I think you mean four degrees Celsius, right? So, so you're talking about four degrees above zero. Above zero, four degrees Celsius. Yes, I'm above talking Celsius. freezing is what we're yes. talking about. Because when it freezes, all these critters, these parasites can't, can't do their thing. They're hibernating their way. But as soon as it goes over four, ticks are out and looking for food. I'm not so worried about fleas at this point, but it's the ticks that I worry about. And the ticks are what carry the diseases such as Ehrlichia and Lyme. In our area, it's Lyme disease. In other areas around you guys, it might be Rocky Mountain spotted fever, Ehrlichia type stuff too. So if you're a hiker, nature enjoyer, and you bring Mm -hmm. your buddies with you, then I would strongly consider keeping them protected against parasites for long periods of time while the temperature is above freezing. Okay. Well, I see, I don't see that much of what you just described here. I mean, at my kennel, I don't see any of that, but in just in terms of my customers and their complaints and the medicines they send their dogs with and whatnot, Giardia seems to be an issue for the people who hike the mountains. So that's, is that dirty, dirty water? Is that what that is? Giardia is another word for a, one of the common names of that infection is beaver fever. And it's because it, people would often associate beaver dams and ponds with getting Giardia. But it's probably, I think it's one of the most, if not the most prevalent intestinal parasite out there. And it's carried by almost all the wildlife. So yes, it's in the water. So if you go camping and you don't treat your water, most of the times if people put iodine pills in the water, it's to kill Giardia. And if you're boiling it, it's to kill that parasite and other nasties that might be in there. Yeah, but your dog isn't drinking boiled water. He's running through the river and drinking it, right? 100%. So, Fast yeah. moving water tends to carry it less, but any okay. ponds and, and even in the, in the damp soil because the birds carry it, the ducks and the geese and all that kind of stuff. So we're seeing a ton more of Giardia. And it's simply because we're, at least in our area, we're being quite good with our environmental concerns and we're managing our environment better. We're cleaning up the environment. And so we're seeing we have cleaner water. And so you're now getting encroachment of wildlife into the urban areas because the urban areas are also encroaching into the wildlife areas. And so you're getting more coyotes and foxes. There's tons of rabbits. 
you know, and we're seeing deer travel through the Don River system in Toronto from downtown all the way back up north again because the river is clean, which is great. But now you bring these animals into contact with your animals and the things that they carry. And so, again, we're talking about prevention. So things you can do to prevent them, you should do, which is parasite prevention. Giardia, we used to have a vaccine for it. It wasn't very good. We don't really use it anymore because I didn't find it was very effective. But knowing that the, these, this kind of parasites carried in stagnant water or slow moving rivers or anything downriver of the beaver dam or along the shoreline, and you want to know that if your guys could be getting it, that's something you want to just be watching for and mindful for. And um, if you start to see symptoms of tummy upset or weight loss, or in my case, because I've had it twice, you burp and you smell scrambled eggs. It's oh, much like oh, oh, yeah. Dr. Joy. That's Sorry, just... but yeah, it's true. <laughs> scrambled eggs, good way to lose 25 pounds, but I don't recommend it. Oh, no, no, don't tell people that. They'll do it on purpose. Don't go, don't go out eating dirty, dirty soil just to lose weight. There's easier ways. Okay, so we're going to go to a break and come back. And when we come back, I'm going to ask your opinion on savanna and serval type cats as pets. Because I keep encountering them as, well, I'm, I'm visiting dogs who are misbehaving out of fear because the family's adopted one. So I got to ask. I'd be afraid to. <laughs> okay, we'll be, we'll be back after the break. Stay tuned to Animal Party Pet Life Radio if you want to find out what kind of cat scares a dog. Stay tuned. Take a bite out of your competition. Advertise your business with an ad in Pet Life Radio podcasts and radio shows. There is no other pet-related media that is as large and reaches more pet parents and pet lovers than Pet Life Radio. With over 7 million monthly listeners, Pet Life Radio podcasts are available on all major podcast platforms. And our live radio stream goes out to over 250 million subscribers on iHeartRadio, Odyssey, TuneIn, Stitcher, and other streaming apps. For more information on how you can advertise on the number one pet podcast and radio network, visit PetLifeRadio.com slash advertise today. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Hello, we're back with Animal Party on Pet Life Radio with me, Deb Wolf. And Dr. Joy. And, you know, I went to this house expecting, they told me, you know, they had this golden doodle. It was already four years old. They would had no problems with it at all this whole time. They have another dog, too, an older kind of layabout sort of carpet dog, very elderly. And then this this happy-go-lucky trained golden doodle who all of a sudden is scared of its own shadow. And, um, you know, it's one of my dogs, so born at my place. So I right away go over to investigate. I got to fix this. What's going on? And lo and behold, they got like a tiger upstairs. So <laughs> what? Uh, and the lady tells me, oh, no, we, we the dogs don't go upstairs. I said, why don't they go upstairs? She's like, well, m- even my children, when they visit, they don't go upstairs either. Oh, how old are your children? Well, they're in their 20s. Uh, OK, what scares a 20 year old? What kind of cat scares a 20 year old, Dr. Joy? <laughs> this goes to the, the fads of getting animals that people find cool and apparently exotic and wild is cool. But unfortunately, they're wild animals and they're predators. And of course, the dog's afraid because the big serval or savannas, they're looking at them like dinner. Yeah, well, this cat was looking at me like dinner. It came down the stairs. She's like, oh, I can't believe it came down the stairs. He never comes down the stairs. Yeah, well, he sees dinner. It's just arrived well, in my my body. I mean, this cat was watching me. And, you know, the lady showed me the curtains, the curtains, which have now become sort of like Tarzan swinging vines. Sure. Yeah. Well, you got to feel bad for these cats because yeah, they're, they're made for Africa. hunting and traveling and doing. So genetically, they're driven to do. And we're trying to, tr- it's like trying to, to trying to turn them into, you know, a Persian cat. Well, they're not. They're huge too, people. They're really, really big. Yeah, they're big. Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> you wouldn't be able to keep a bobcat in the house. You know, That's about the size, right? Yeah, they're actually, some of them are bigger. 
And they're a bobcat. So they're smaller than a cougar or a lion or a very yeah. large dog. But the cat is a superior predator to the canine. The feline is so much superior. So when they're in this little 10 pound package, we don't really notice that they're a lot more mighty than a dog. But when they're bigger, like 30 pounds, holy or moly, or 40, those nails, those claws. Wow. No, no little well-behaved golden doodle is going to be able to contend with that in the attic. And well, and and again, you've got this animal keeping it in a small space. It's highly intelligent. They're supposed to spend a lot of time looking for food, using their intelligence, using their physicality. And then you cramp them in a tiny spot where they should have kilometers of territory to roam. Now they have a couple hundred square feet and they're going to be happy there. And unfortunately, you see a lot of them on social media posting how nice they are and how fun they are. You know, it's like people who keep other exotic creatures like primates. I think it's cruel, unfortunately. I think the people are well-intentioned, most of them, but it's cruel to the animals because you can't let them live the way they're intended and then they come into conflict. And when the conflicts happen, the conflicts are horrible. Well, when you talk about primates, I mean, the people I've seen with them mostly are getting something, some kind of positive feedback from the neediness of the infant primate. Sure. But as soon as that primate ages into an age of sexuality and adulthood, they tend to abandon them because the animal's no longer this little baby with big eyes that hangs off them and is so sweet and, you know, compelling. Now it's actually got its own desires and needs and wants and it's really strong and and unpredictable they think well, it's not unpredictable to a monkey but it's unpredictable to a human and it's not a little baby anymore and that's the thing these these i'm sure this serval of us they are just adorable as kittens but just a, a month and later a cool factor you can't deny it but it's it's a lot more than 99.9 percent .9 of people are prepared to be able to handle and it's not fair and the outcomes always almost end tragically and that's where i end up getting involved and i would prefer never to have to be involved in another one of those cases again but they're yeah. read unfortunately readily available you know and unfortunately people are prepared to buy them and there's no regulation and now what do you do what do you do when it's 35 pounds and everything's been fine until someone has to go to the hospital well, yeah, like what if they attack a child? I mean, they very well could. You know, it's, uh, it's not. These it's, are the things it's, that happen. And just go back to thinking about what this animal was designed to do and how we're keeping it. And it's unkind, in my opinion. It's unkind to confine such a highly developed predator and try to turn it into a house cat because they're not. Because we can't provide the range. You can't provide the stimulation. You can't provide the exercise that they need. Well, or even the primates we're talking about. I mean, you're not a monkey. Your family isn't a monkey family. Like this is not ideal. Whatever no. you, whatever your good intentions are, it's not. It's not the best for the monkey. No, I would consistently argue that that is the case. It is not in the best interest of the animal, or the raccoon, or the deer, or I mean, people adopt wildlife that's injured, which is great, but it needs to then go to a rehabilitation center that can get it on its way, as opposed to live a life of strangeness with humans yeah. forever. Yes. You know, yes, where it's where it's trained to wear clothing and do strange things. OK, so we, we kind of covered that. Um, yeah, definitely covered that. I did. Bill Maher had something funny. I know you touched on how we're encroaching on the wildlife and that's why there's more parasites in our life. But he had this to say about it. He's a comedian in the U.S. Bill Maher he has a show and he was saying, OK, so the police were searching for this bear who attacked a man. And Bill's comment was, well, they're hunting in the woods for a man who was attacked by a bear, where he was trying to kill a bear where the bear lives. Stand your ground, bear. He was using <laughs> yeah. it. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, seriously, right? So like people, if you're going to go where the bears are, make lots of noise and don't have food and keep your dog on leash and don't instigate something that the bear will then have to pay for with his life. But it's all about the prevention, again, like being smart. So if you want to walk where bears live you need to know about it educate yourself and then walk where bears live if you want to get yourself a big dog then be prepared do your education if you i mean if you want a wild animal you want to keep one if you do your research you'll understand why it's not a good idea you know i'm thinking when you said it goes above four so it's plus from zero there must be a lot more bear encounters with the bears sort of half hibernating i would think so i'm not sure this year i haven't heard from anybody yet about numbers or whatnot but i would think that could be very much likely 
Yeah. All right. So I want to ask you, fastest wild animals on earth. Do you think any canines made the list or any felines? Uh, I would think a whippet or a greyhound would make it. Well, they're not wild, though. Only wild, oh, wild animals. animals. Wild animals. Fastest wild animals. Yeah, they didn't count domesticated dogs. Fastest land animal still has to be a cheetah. Cheetahs there. Yes. Ding, ding, ding. Number one. But they're not ordered. So we've just got a bunch of them. And there's one more feline. I mean, peregrine falcons. No, they're not there. They're not we've there. Got, they dive the fastest. Anim- well, okay. We've got cheetah and we've got lion. And there are actually three canines on the list. Can you guess any of them? Wild, wild dog, African wild dog, Cape hunting dog. So you're close. It's a, okay. it's a similar thing. Yep. Two more. They're fast. Two human? more that we encounter in our world. I'm not sure. Well, we've it's got. Pumping. Okay. So people listen up. Greg Fox is one of them. But even more importantly, coyote. I didn't think oh, that, yeah. but a coyote is fast. I didn't. Th- yeah. And then I think about, yeah. Okay. The way they appear, disappear, appear, disappear. Why am I drawing attention to coyotes? Because they are everywhere. If you think they're not in your neighborhood, you're probably mistaken. So be coyote smart. Don't let your little dogs out alone. Be with them all the time. You know, there's a guy in LA with a van and he goes around and he picks up little dogs for people. They pay him to exercise their little dog in the back of his van on one of those. What do you call those things where you walk? Treadmills. Treadmills on a treadmill. Because people in that neighborhood are so housebound from coyotes they can't even walk their little dogs on leashes anymore so they are uh, very much preying on pets so watch we, we lose about three or four dogs a season this really? in the last couple of years to, to coyotes and cats for sure with cats around well, and you never know what's the biggest dog that's how we got our most recent kitten oh the mama we got our most recent kitten this summer because her mother was eaten by a coyote when she was about two weeks Oh, she was so you had so to wife... bottle feed or did you put that off on your text? No, are you kidding? My wife was walking around with her sweatshirt backwards oh, and the kitten living yeah. in the hood sitting in front of her for a month. Yeah, no, I get it. I <laughs> Yes, I get it all too well. So people, you know, when you see wildlife and you think maybe it's abandoned, wait, because a lot of times the mom is nearby. And if you do take this baby bird or baby rabbit or whatever it is, It's going to be every two hours, every four hours, even at night, it needs feeding. So it's not a a light job at all, right? Nope. Very time consuming. And then the cat's so attached to you forever and has all these strange habits. But, well, that's uh, something. That's another thing. But I got to tell you, my wife loves baby kitty. That's her name for the rest of her life. Oh, of course. Of course. Uh, They're both super attached. So on this fastest animal list, Horses, quarter horses also made the list. And then antelopes, wildebeest, gazelle, and elk are on there in addition to the animals we mentioned. So it kind of makes sense that the the coyote would be there and the cheetah and the lion. And I don't know where the greyhound would rank. I do know they run at 60 kilometers an hour. Which no, is I, you got to think that whippets would be as fast or faster than, than coyotes. Yeah, you'd think, right? And even some of those Aussie shepherds. Well, they seem it. Yeah, they do. I don't know how long a distance it was measured on. And if it was, it must have been sprints, given what the quarter horse is quarter mile. So it must have been sprints. It's interesting to contemplate. I wouldn't want to have to run away from any of these animals. <laughs> I don't think I'd do too well. And you know what? If for people listening from Florida, alligators are surprisingly fast on land. On the sprint. Yes, they are. If you're golfing or something and you see one and you think eh, it's, it's way in the distance. Yeah. Maybe for you, it's in the distance, but for the alligator, you are very short distance away. It can get to you fast, fast. So be very, very mindful of that, especially with pets. You know, you don't want to be throwing fetch into ponds you don't know in areas where there's alligators because that's just, what's the biggest dog that was ever taken by a coyote in your practice? I think they're all like, most of them were Yorkies. Uh, I think a Bichon. Probably like Whoa, a. Oh, that's a fairly hefty Bichon. lift. I mean, that's what, 25 pounds? But a couple will come and yeah. they'll have a female who will try to lure even Labradors, like bigger dogs, away. And then the pack's out there. So it's not just grabbing the one dog, it's dogs who get lured off the property into the woods and then never return. Oh, yeah. So one oh, yeah. Bernadoodle died that way. Oh, oh, that's sad. And it was that's probably so trusting and friendly and went out yep. and got ambushed by a pack of attacking rivals. Yep. Oh, terrible. Oh, oh, I don't like that talk. Okay, well, let's talk about 
something happy. There's a cat cafe here in Vancouver. Really? Where you go, yes, you go and you pay your money and you get to sit down and have your little coffee or whatever. And around you are cats, many, many cats, all of which need homes. So you can make arrangements to adopt one if you bond with one. And I just love this. So I wanted to ask a brilliant idea. Cat Cafe. They're called Cat Fay. And I've talked to them. They're going to come on a future show. But if anyone listening in Vancouver is looking for something interesting to do, look up Cat Fay. And you will be supporting cat rescue while you have lunch. If you can't have a cat in your life and you wish you could, <laughs> or you have a little little boy or girl that's cat crazy, this is the place to go. All right. So we're going to go to break. That's a terrific idea. <laughs> yeah, isn't it? Isn't it nice? And it, oh, I can't. I'm going to go, right? I'm going to go as my I think my research. blood pressure would drop 10 points just sitting in there. <laughs> yeah, and they must. I mean, I'm assuming they pick super friendly cats. And all different types, right? I mean, they can't just have Persians lying around. They got to have some interactive cats and some toys. I'm I'm looking forward to it. I think it sounds great. You have to let me know how you like it because that sounds super. Yes. And if you're allergic to cats, definitely take your meds before you go. Okay. (laughs) So we're going to go to break and come back with Dr. Jory, Dr. Jory Bachnick from Toronto practicing there. And I'm going to ask him, what does your vet wish you knew when you came in, when did they just try not to roll their eyes because it's so frustrating because, oh, oh, here comes another person who just doesn't have it together. Okay, so we're going to find out what the vet wishes you knew, how you can make your vet visit more productive, more efficient, safer for your animal. Stay tuned on Animal Party Pet Life Radio with me, Dab Wolf. Pet Life Radio, the number one pet radio network on the planet, joins forces with iHeartRadio to put the power of your pets in your pocket. Awesome. Download the iHeartRadio app and rock Pet Life Radio on your phone, on your tablet, on your Xbox, in your car. Pet talk, pet tunes, and fun pet times. Pet Life Radio and iHeartRadio. Positively possum. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com Hello, we're back on Animal Party Pet Life Radio. And it's Deb Walt hosting with my guest, Dr. Jory Bachnick. And I've just asked him, what would make your life easier and happier? What, what do you wish your customers, your clients, the dog and cat owners, what do you wish they knew? Well, I think it falls in sort of like two categories. The first one would be how to make the experience as pleasant and stress-free for their pet. So okay. for instance, let's start off with cats. If cats are, most cats are, I think are fair to say that live in one home and they don't really go anywhere. So they're not used to be taking out. So if you're taking your cat out of the house in a carrier that they only see once a year when they come to see us, they're afraid. And so how can we start to do things to make them less afraid when they come to the clinic, which makes it much easier for us and way less stressful for the cat. And so some things you can do are have the carrier out more, use the carrier to put special treats in. So the carrier actually becomes a good thing as opposed to, oh my God, I see the carrier and then they take off and you have to pry them out from underneath the bed and you're wounded and the cats are coming with these big eyes because they're terrified. And so getting them used to the carrier putting them in it, using special treats for it. And they've got these really good pheromone products now where you can spray it to make it relaxing. You can use even catnip. So the the carrier no longer is a thing to be feared, but it's a thing to be enjoyed. And it's a sort of like a refuge, similar to how a dog would view their den. And so then when you they're can coming hide to us, things now they're not there. all fun. You can leave the door open so they can come yep. and go and hide special and things go, in there. Nobody bugs them. And so right. it's a really safe place. Plus, the benefit of this is if you ever travel, you don't have to necessarily give them medication because they're in their crate, which is a good place. And so they're happier in the car in the crate or they're happier in the plane. Or when you go to someone's house or a cottage, you, when you bring your pet, you can because it's much less stressful. Well, or even if you have no plans to ever travel with your cat, if there's a flood or a fire or something happens terrible and the, you know, the rescuers come and they throw the cat in a cage, or you evacuate and you get to a shelter, your cat needs to be calm in a cage. So make sure you do this regardless. Everything about this just makes life easier later, just in case. It's all about preparation. And now some cats, they're just not people cats. And so they like the family. They just don't really love anybody else. 
And so if you know this, we've got options for them to just kind of take the edge off them. There's a medication I really like to use to make them less fearful called gabapentin. It's very easy. It comes in liquid. We generally give them a bit, a half of a mil to one mil of this. And all it does, it's not a sedative. It sort of takes all the edge off them. So they come in a lot more relaxed, which means they're not coming out knives out as soon as you open the carry. They're kind of relaxed enough so I can do if we are slow and calm and I have pheromone sprays in the room and the lighting is good and it's quiet and they're in cat only rooms that they're much less on guard and they're much more willing to let us examine them, look at them, perhaps give them their vaccines if they need them, collect samples if we need them without having to use more heavy handed sedation. And so if we plan these things with our cats, I find these appointments go far more easily so that the next appointment isn't even worse than the last one. Because if every time you have to bring your poor little kitty to us, you have to find them, grab them, drag them, shove them, stick them and schlep them. The next one's going to be 10 times worse. It's like, I remember when that thing came out, I am not going in there, you know? And then it's like every Tom and Jerry episode you ever saw. So a little bit of preparation, a little bit of forethought can just make the whole experience easier for everybody. So there's that side of it. And for our dogs, we also have dogs who are afraid. Some dogs who are rescues, who have unknown histories, who are fearful of people or new places. What I find works really well for them is just bring them by the clinic some days to get treats. Come in, say hi, grab some treats and go. So as opposed to the clinic being a place where they come where they're unwell or they have to get things done to them, they're used to coming on the way to the dog park. Can they come grab and, treats? And, and you go? know what? The scale is right there, people. For all of you who think your dog is cute, pudgy, or chubby, or, or um, you know, he's kind of like you needs to lose a little pay, a little weight, and you make jokes about it. If that's you, if every time you go to your vet for your once a year checkup, he has worse news to give you about your dog's weight. Well, while you're visiting for this happy go lucky get treats visit. Uh, maybe step on the scale, get your dog on the scale, be honest with yep. yourself, right? Because I think that's another of your pet right. you're, just, you're talking about being honest with your dog because you're not going to make me go on that scale, are you? <laughs> right. Because I don't like being honest with myself right now. <laughs> just the dog. But if that's okay. another of your pet peeves, isn't it? People who let their dogs suffer from overweight. That weight, when you, that we're talking about our animals' well-being. So weight has got to be a primary one. Because it affects every organ, affects their joints, it affects their quality of life, it affects your quality because if they lose mobility, things become a lot more challenging. And so the problem with weight is it's subtle. And if you're always looking at your pet and they're only putting a couple pounds on a year, it's a slow slide and you get habituated to how they look. It's you don't see it until when I see them and I haven't seen them for a year and your beagle who weighed 20 pounds now weighs 30 pounds. It's not uncommon. I'm like, oh my God, what happened? You know, and that's like me gaining 60 pounds in one year. Yeah, exactly. People don't realize, oh, it's only five pounds. Yeah, but he's only supposed to be 10 pounds. He's gained 50% of his body weight and his belly. If your, if your dog's belly makes like gets dirty from the ground or drags the snow, you're probably looking at a really overweight dog, right? I mean, sometimes I think people, they need to look from above. They need to feel, they need to sort of put their dog in a stand position facing them, looking right at your dog and just take your hands one on each side of him and run it from the front leg to the back leg along that center, that, that flank, you know, where all the ribs are. And if you don't feel any ribs, if it's all nice and soft and kind of yeah, soft and there's no edges at all, then your dog's probably overweight, you know, really, as you do this, you don't see ribs because that would be too skinny. You don't see any ribs unless you've got a greyhound or a whippet or a breed that you're supposed to, you don't see any ribs but you run your fingers along, you kind of feel like you're running along a banister, ba bump, ba bump, ba bump, ba bump, then that's probably a good way. So that's like a little quick test. If, if you don't feel anything, maybe ask your vet, <laughs> maybe go by the scale, have a little way in for your dog because chances are, and cats, cats have a fat pad, kind of, kind of like where the muffin top where on some women would be a, would be a, a beer a belly. Yes, yeah. Right there. That's a, and that, that doesn't need to be round and chunky there like they're carrying a baby or a joey kangaroo baby i wish but that <laughs> kind of segues into you know what other things do we want to help our animals in preparation for their visits you know like so getting they're having their weights come in because if you come in for their happy visit come in grab treats get their weight and go other things that we would really like 
if you knew would be like, what does your dog eat? Something very straightforward. Know that. And how much? I can't tell you how many times people say one coffee can worth. Oh, or, you here know, the too. Milk worth. One scoop. And then they send this ridiculous. Yes. Well, is that two cups or three cups or one and a half cups? Like, cause the, cause the dog chewed the scoop or the scoop isn't here. You forgot to send it. So now what do I do? Exactly. Huh. So how much are you feeding them? And when it comes to what your weight of your, of your pet should be, trust me, trust your vet. Don't trust what the internet says or what your friends say. Because my goal is to have your pet be the healthiest, and happiest, the longest I possibly can. I can't tell you how many times people say, oh, my bull mastiff is supposed to look like this. And I'm like, no, oh, not supposed gosh. to look like a Hereford cow. He's well, supposed to have a nice tucked up abdomen, be super muscular, and he should be able to clear an eight foot fence without even breaking a sweat. And if he can't, and he's likely too heavy. Yeah. If you're lifting him in and out of the car and he's two <laughs> years old, there's a problem here, you know, but then they'll say to you, to me anyway, I'll say a lot of times it's the other way around. You're not feeding your dog enough. He's too slim and he exercises a lot while he's here at camp. It's five acres. He runs like mad. I'm going to double his feet or I'm going to add an extra cup of meal or whatever it is. And they'll say, but the package says blah, 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 blah. Well, the packages, if you turn it over, it'll say one to four cups per meal or some ridiculously large amount, like variation. You don't know. Was it one cup or four cups? And how much do they know how much your dog actually weighs and how old he is? And so so what about those packages? They just want you to use more, right? The food companies actually take the metabolic requirements of a pregnant lactating female to calculate what their food should be. The amount you feed because wow. they don't want you to underfeed. If you overfeed your pet based on their instructions, that's your problem. But if you follow their instructions and your pet dies of starvation, that's on them. So every every single food that you'll buy in the grocery store or pet store is overfed. Every single one. And but further wow. to your point, nobody's my, life is oh. static. So when they go to camp with you and they're running 20K a day, of course they're gonna need more. But if they're sitting yeah. at home, watching TV and waiting for mom and dad to come home to only walk for half an hour, they need substantially less. Right. Yeah. And that's just common sense. They don't get the same every day if they're eating the same every day. And and that doesn't mean that you say to yourself, okay, we're going for a 10K run. I'm going to give him four cups of food right now and then we'll head out the door. No, 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 no. <laughs> we don't want to be eating big meals before huge amounts of exercise. Can you talk about that for a second? Sure. Um, it's also very appropriate because we just did a few gastric dilatation, volvulus oh, surgeries on some gosh. things that we have. Talk yeah. about preventable. Preventable. So here's a, well, here's another one. Like you wouldn't eat a huge lasagna before you went to play baseball or football just or hockey. You just wouldn't do those things. Don't Your dog will be more than happy to eat that. But when they run, it's going to give them gut rot. It's going to get them sick. And some of these deeper chested dogs, it can act like a little bit of a pendulum. We're not exactly sure of how it happens. But it can result in some significant um, disease processes, which there's, which you can result in twisting of their bowel, twisting of their stomach. You want if you if you're going to have a big run, a big exercise, you want to be mostly empty on the inside. When you talk about feeding, it's after the exercise is done, everyone's recovered. What are they going to eat for dinner before they chill? What are they going to have for breakfast? That kind yeah. of thing. And it's hours after. It's not right hours. after they come in panting. I, I've noticed that the herding dogs are smart enough to puke up whatever the human was stupid enough to feed them before big exercise. But a lot of dogs are not. And their stomach, what you're talking about, where their stomach turns, oh, this is huge surgery, weeks of recovery, thousands of dollars, all because you gave him a big meal or a binge drink while he was still revved up or about to go for exercise. Right? And like it's I would bad. Say very, very high mortality. Very, very high. Very I bad. think the dog in um, that movie, Marley, uh, I can't remember the name of it. It was with the, the dog was called Marley and Jennifer Aniston was in it. I think that's what that dog died of. It's very common. Not It's not as rare as people think. Unfortunately not. It's getting to the point now where some are recommending my deep chested dogs be preventatively have their stomachs tacked to try to prevent this. I'm not a huge advocate of that in our area, but I know there are many veterinarians who are. You know, because of what they see in their areas, you know, and so oh, I again, don't it, like it, that. It, it, that seems I mean, I have, you know, as you know, golden doodles, standard poodles, labradoodles, all of them, especially the poodles could be considered deep chested. And 
yep. prone to this. And I've never had any, but I tell all my owners, you know, don't overdo binge eating, binge drinking right before. And there's some dogs who have strange habits, like they like to run through the river drinking while they run or a strange thing like that, that you'd kind of have to train them out of so you don't get this problem. You know, you, you try. just want them. Yeah. One of my dogs <laughs> like to find sprinklers and he would get his foot, stop the sprinkler from moving, stick his mouth over it, fill his gut up. He'd watch it blow up like a balloon. He'd step away, barf, and he would do it again. Oh, that's got to be allowed. Yeah, of course it was. It was. <laughs> See, some, yes. some of course it was. All my dogs are broken. The, the veterinarian is like the shoemaker's <laughs> children that have no shoes. The veterinarian has the worst dogs. It's true. Oh, my God. Oh, that's terrible. Okay. So, well, that's very positive. We could end the show there. Because I think that's really funny. One more thing, though, I wanted to say, I have these standard poodles and they're and they're, you know, really coiffed and groomed and all that. I send them for professional grooming, but they're kind of like Chia pets before they need a haircut. They really need a haircut. They got this huge mass of tangled dreads and whatnot. And the other day I was petting one of them, one of them two days before haircut. And she yelped when I was petting her and kind of balked and, and acted all head shy. And it. You know, if I just went on with my day and ignored that, thought, oh, well, it was just maybe it was a static shock. I'm not going to worry about it. La, la, la. Um, I might not have noticed something very big because this is a dog who's super cuddly, loves to be touched. OK, why is she doing this? So I grab her and I look at her closely. And sure enough, there's this massive burr on inner cheek hair that's worked its way in there. Right. And she's she right away shows me how it worked its way in there by trying to get it out with her paw and works it even more. And it's like, you know, it's so simple. I can cut that out of there. No problem. She'll have a great day. But if I leave that and leave it and leave it and leave it, it's going to become a veterinary emergency. And, you know, It'll it's be a you're going, infection. Yeah, or a hot spot, or I don't know, some something really gross. And it's so simple. Just touch them all the time, brush them all the time. You know, even when they're big and furry, make sure you get your hands on them because stuff can be hiding and you want to find it. At minimum, the beginning of the day and the end of the day. Give them a good once over. One of the things I am telling, here's something you can tell all of your clients as well. Okay. If you're going for walks in the woods, one of my favorite preventative things, pick up a lint roller. You know, the kind that have the tape that you peel off after you use them to roll them off, to roll your clothes with? Yes. After you go for a walk in the woods, roll your dog's body. The ticks will stick to it. And be prepared for icky things. On but they don't know which is in your environment. He's forewarned is forearmed. And there's things you can do for people with allergies, like change your clothes and brush the dog outside. Um, if you've got a really chill dog, you can get them used to the vacuum and be able to vacuum them with a hose attachment. There's things you can do to make it easier for others. Uh, but that wipe down, I mean, you're going to get a lot of bugs on there and pollen and stuff that, you know, really need breathing in your air inside. So that's a great recommendation. Clean them off. And after those walks, that's when you're going to find the ticks. And then before they burrow into the skin, yep, you want it off before they stick on, or before they drop off in your house. Yeah. And wait, you know, a good amount and then reappear for the next feeding on whoever happens to be nearby, which could be you. Exactly. So, okay. So the other day before we end, I'm just to say one more thing, one more fun thing. The other day I was um, picking up tennis balls all around the living room and I ended up with a whole bunch. And so I sat there and juggled, which I do badly. But you'll never get better audience for juggling than a bunch of dogs. They think it's great. No matter how bad a juggler you are, they think it's like um, the most magical thing you could ever do is to sit and juggle for them. And then when the balls drop, they go for them and they bring them back to you. And it's like you're a star. So <laughs> if you can learn to juggle, it's well worth it. You will definitely impress your dog with that. Can you juggle, Jory? No, really badly. Not that well for you. <laughs> They don't mind. They don't mind. The more balls that go flying, the better. Just the attempt is worth it. Okay, so everybody, that was Dr. Jory, and we're going to have him back really soon because it's always a good show on Animal Party Pet Life Radio. Thank you for coming, Dr. Jory. My pleasure. Nice to talk to you. Guys. Okay, everybody, be good to your animals. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs>